Well, the recording of this week's prophecy update is going to be a little bit different because I don't have access to a camera to record my face. So I'm going to record this in classic mode. I'm going to record my PowerPoint presentation and my audio. I'm going to title this presentation Bomboozled. And I'm going to give full credit for that to Bill Salas, who sent me an email with that suggestion. And I think you'll see why as we get later into the presentation. All, every week I talk about the convergence of events and the acceleration of things, at least in the stage setting, that are going to fulfill Bible prophecy. And I think this week is indicative of, of similar to what we, we say every week, but maybe even more so with all of the different things that have occurred. And I think you'll see that as we go through this. And we're going to conclude our thing on the convergence of things this week with a rather stunning announcement from the Temple Institute that was made just this morning in Jerusalem, confirming, I think, what a lot of us have suspected, but it's now out there in video form, and I'll show you the video of that. That'll be right at the end of the presentation. So here we go. It, it's interesting. Uh, Cole Executive was noting this, that the Environmental Protection Agency, in their regulations of companies in, for envir on the environmental side in this country, uses 25, over 25 million words. The Bible itself only uses 783,137 words, which means that our EPA thinks that what they have to say is apparently 38 times more important than what is said in the Bible. It's a stunning statistic. The, uh, Robert Murray of Murray Energy said this about Obama. His legacy will be that of the nation's greatest destroyer, and he certainly is the greatest enemy that I personally and my family and employees have ever had. The economy is a thing. I don't talk a, a lot about that, but there's a lot of things going on in the economy. There's some things, some, some suggestions that there's going to be some major resets that are going to happen worldwide in uh, the next couple of months, uh, particularly in September. Uh, that coincides with a lot of other things. There's a big environmental conference in November uh, in Europe, I believe, and then there's also uh, the Pope will be coming to speak at the UN on climate change and also doing a uh, mass in Philadelphia and his uh, visit coincides uh, with some other things going on in the latter part of September. I want to just um, reference though a report. I saw this at the front page of the New York Times this morning, Greece the Sacrificial Lamb. Most economists are saying that what you're seeing happening in Greece is what you're going to see happen in different countries around the world as uh, companies go bankrupt, cities and municipalities and even some state governments go bankrupt. We live at a time where the debt load has just become too much. Phoenix Capital Research has a report that's just out. You can get a free copy of it and download it. I'll just make one reference to it. In there, they have a stunning list of the statistics of everything that the Fed and other central banks have done since the 2008 financial crisis. Things are not working well. It is a, a stunning admission that things are just not working out. Here's what they say in their summary part of their report. In a nutshell, the feds have tried to combat a debt problem by issuing more debt. They're pumping trillions of dollars into the financial system, trying to prop Wall Street and the stock market. They've managed to kick off a rally in stocks, but they have not addressed the fundamental issues plaguing the financial market. Stocks are headed for another crash, possibly as bad as the one we saw in October, November 2008. As you know, that crash wiped out $11 trillion in household wealth in a matter of weeks. There's no telling the damage this second round will cause. And you can find an article about this over at Zero Hedge. <clears throat> it's a, it can be rather depressing, but I think people need to address their own personal financial issues uh, sooner rather than later. A good idea is to get out of debt and reduce your debt as much as possible. And I think you need to take some reasonable steps that you personally think are um, warranted to uh, deal with what I think everybody says is a coming financial crisis. Exactly how it will unfold um, is, is not known. But it uh, could be presage a very uh, difficult time here in the United States and around the world. Well, President Obama went to the country of his father over the weekend uh, he's there, uh, I think, even today in Kenya. He had a meeting with the Kenya president. Now, prior to him going, the Kenyan president and the Kenyan government made a specific request, government made a specific request to President Obama not to talk about the gay rights agenda because 
Kenya has a very different, more conservative, Judeo-Christian view of gay rights and gay activity. They don't like it. They don't want to talk about it. The president of Kenya and President Obama then had a joint uh, press conference. And at the joint press conference, this question was asked. Secondly, can you, com can you comment on the state of gay and lesbian, the treatment of gay and lesbians in Kenya, which rights groups have called dismal, and President Kenyatta, ha Kenyatta has called a non-issue? And can you please also respond to criticism about the state of gay rights in your country? Now, first, President I Obama. I believe in the principle of treating people equally under the law, and that they are deserving of equal protection under the law, and that the state should not discriminate against people based on their sexual orientation. And I say that recognizing that there may be people who have different religious or cultural beliefs, but the issue is how does the state operate relative to people? I'm unequivocal on this. Um, so somebody is a law-abiding citizen who is going about their business and working in a job and obeying the traffic signs and doing all the other things that good citizens are supposed to do and not harming anybody. The idea that they are going to be treated differently or abused because of who they love is wrong. Full stop. And, you know, uh, the, the, the state does not need to weigh in on, uh, you know, religious doctrine. The state just has to say, we're going to treat everybody equally under the law. And then everybody else can have their own opinions. All right. Just like President Obama, I think we also need to be able to speak frankly about some of these things. And the fact of the matter is that Kenya and the United States, we share so many values. This is why I repeatedly say that for Kenyans today, the issue of gay rights is really a non-issue. We want to focus on other areas that our day-to-day -day living for our people. Maybe once, like you have, overcome some of these challenges, we can begin to look at new ones. But as of now, the fact remains that this issue is not really an issue that is on the foremost mind of Kenyans, and that is the fact. Well, you can see the president's rather terse comments to that, President Obama's terse comments to that. Well. Following up on the gay rights agenda, in the New York Times, uh, supposedly the newspaper of record on the editorial page uh, last uh, Tuesday, was this article by a law professor. Is polygamy next? Listen to some of the things that this law professor says in his article, William Body. He says this. With same-sex marriage on the books, we can now ask whether polyamorous relationships should be next. There is a very good argument that they should. Justice Anthony M. Kennedy's majority opinion in Obergefell did not focus primarily on the issue of sexual orientation. Instead, and I think this is something that I mentioned, it was very broad in its language. He did not go into cite a specific statute or uh, provision of the Constitution, he cited it in a very broad general terms, which a lot of people read it and were concerned that this is going to have uh, more than um, specific application. <coughs> so instead, its main focus was on a fundamental right to marry, a right that he said could not be limited to rigid historical definitions or left to the legislative process. That right was about autonomy and fulfillment, about child rearing and the social order. By those lights, groups of adults who have profound polyamorous attachments and wish to build families and join the community have a strong claim to a right to marry. 
The lesson of the same-sex marriage case is that we should not be too wedded to historical assumptions. We should recognize that once we abandon the rigid constraints of history, we cannot be sure that we will know where the future will take us. Well, on another cultural front, uh, this uh, editorial cartoon from uh, Ramirez and Investors Business Daily about the Planned Parenthood fetal harvest chart. And uh, again, Ramirez, I think, is probably the best of the uh, different uh, editorial cartoonists out there. So uh, now we know that these two videos have come out and have put Planned Parenthood in a very bad light. And even the New York Times in a front page article uh, the other day admitted that the activist that has put this out, the Center for Medical Progress, has really activated the abortion debate all over again. And the, the, the videos, at least the two that have been released thus far, are stunning in the callous nature of these women doctors who are talking about these aborted fetuses, these aborted human beings, as merely products and commodities to be traded in the market. It, it, it's a stunning video. Now, Planned Parenthood has pushed back strongly. Uh, they have... Uh, the Democrats in Congress have called for the Obama administration not to investigate Planned Parenthood, but to investigate the Center for Media or the Center for Medical Progress. And in fact, it was announced the other day in Politico and other uh, political blogs that the Obama Department of Justice has now announced plans that they are going to investigate not the group that is harvesting fetal tissue and selling it on the market but they're going to go after the Center for Medical Progress for exposing Planned Parenthood's heinous, sickening activities. The U.S. Department of Justice announced plans to investigate the group that produced undercover videos showing Planned Parenthood employees admitting that they harvest and sell organs ripped from the bodies of aborted, of aborted babies. Politico reported the news of the, up, of the coming DOJ investigation earlier today. In response to a request by House Democrats, Attorney General Loretta Lynch said Wednesday afternoon that the justice that justice would review all of the information and determine what the appropriate steps moving forward would be. David Dottelin, the head of the director of the Center for Medical Progress, said this in response. They will attack me and my organization all day long, but that does not change the facts about what our investigation has uncovered and what the American people now know that Planned Parenthood is engaged in an enterprise-wide operation that traffics and sells baby body parts. Hillary Clinton, who uh, at one point in her career won the Margaret Sanger Award, she was the uh, racist uh, founder of, uh, of Planned Parenthood, uh, had this to say at a when she was questioned about what was going on with the exposure about Planned Parenthood, at a political stop, a political campaign stop for her in Greenville, South Carolina. I don't have all the facts, but Planned Parenthood has apologized for the uh, insensitivity of the employee uh, who was uh, taped, uh, and they will continue to answer questions uh, for um, Congress and others. But for more than a century, Planned Parenthood has provided essential services for women, not just reproductive health services, including access to affordable family planning, but cancer screenings, for example, and other health checkups. And I think it is unfortunate that Planned Parenthood has been the object of such a concerted attack um, for so many years. And it's really an attack against a woman's right to choose to make the most personal, difficult decisions um, that any woman would face uh, based on her faith and her and the medical uh, advice that she's given. So I'm hoping that uh, this um, uh, situation will not further undermine the very important services that Planned Parenthood provides uh, across our country. Uh, you know, now that we have the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there, is, uh, there are options for a lot of women to seek medical care that didn't have those before. Uh, but Planned Parenthood still remains a very important part
heart of the whole health care delivery system, particularly, but not exclusively, for poor women. And I just strongly believe that we need to make sure that it can continue to uh, do that um, into the future. Well, you know, this is interesting. They're, the, the Center for Medical Progress has been very clever in the way they've done this. My understanding is that there are many more videos that are yet to come, and they are worse. And remember this Hillary Clinton. She doesn't want people that disagree with her to have any say. Remember that she said this at a women's conference earlier this year. Rights have to exist in practice, not just on paper. Laws have to be backed up with resources and political will and deep-seated cultural codes, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed. As I... This is showing that there is no difference between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton ideologically. Well, here is the uh, director of the Center for Medical Progress uh, interviewed the other night on Hannity, and you'll see some of the clips that are at issue, particularly the most recent one that was released. The sale of aborted fetuses by Planned Parenthood may not only be the only wrongdoing uncovered by the Center for Medical Progress. In fact, a high-ranking Planned Parenthood doctor was also caught on tape discussing her potential compliance with some pretty unethical practices involving patients receiving abortions. Now, please be advised that the video we're showing is extremely graphic. It's disturbing. You don't want your children watching. Ready? Watch this. If our usual technique is suction at 10 to 12 weeks, and we switch to using an iPad or something with less suction or to increase the odds that will come out of an intact specimen, then we're kind of violating the protocol that says to the patient, we're not doing anything different in our care of you. And to mm -hmm. me, that's a kind of a specious little argument, and I wouldn't object to asking Ian, who's our surgeon who does the cases, to use an iPad at that gestation wage in order to increase the odds that he was going to get an intact specimen. But I do need to throw it out there as a concern, because the patient is signing something, and we're signing something, saying we're not changing anything in the way we're managing you, just because we agreed to give tissue. Pretty grotesque. Joining me now, the man behind the new campaign that's exposing Planned Parenthood's unethical behavior from the Center for Medical Progress, David Daladin, is with us. How are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good, son. How are you? All right. Um, I mean, I watched this. Not only in both tapes are they basically saying, well, the law is up to interpretation, and they pretty much are acknowledging that they know it's against the law. Then they're quibbling over prices. Then they're talking about wanting to buy Lamborghinis. Then they're talking about how they do it so that they don't ruin the, spe the specimens and crushing this part of the baby and not that part of the baby. Walk us through the history of how you got into this and what, you, what your take is. Sure. So for the past two and a half years, the Center for Medical Progress conducted a long-term, in-depth, comprehensive investigative journalism study of how exactly Planned Parenthood harvests and sells the body parts from the babies that they abort. And this is something that Planned Parenthood has been doing for decades at this point. It's something that, in, by their own admission in their press statements that for the past week, that their top-level leadership supports and knows is going on. They've admitted that they harvest the specimens, and they've admitted that they receive payment for it in exchange for those specimens. Really, the only bone of contention that's left is whether or not they receive a financial benefit from those payments and exactly how much the profit is. But as you can start to see in the video that we released yesterday, um, the Dr. Gatter, the president of Planned Parenthood's Medical Directors Council, admits that they really don't have any costs and don't have to do anything when they harvest the specimens, so the money that they're getting is straight up profit to their bottom line. All right. Now, their claim at Planned Parenthood is that, oh, this is all heavily edited. Explain the context of each tape that you released and how long you ha had taped them, and are there more tapes coming out? Sure. So for the two summary videos that we've released so far, the full, um, the full unedited footage of those conversations has been available on our YouTube channel from the very beginning. So the public can judge for themselves the accuracy of the, of the summaries that we put up of just the highlights. Um, ultimately, these are you know, one to three and a half hour long conversations. So again, you know, it's all very interesting. And frankly, there's information in there that we have to leave out for time reasons that, um, that I think just continues to confirm, confirm our case. So the, the, full, the full conversations are up there and everybody can look at those and get more information. Well, I didn't see anything from what I've read and what I saw that it was taken out of context. This was in the proper context that you released it. It wasn't 
you know, if you're releasing the full tape, as you said, everyone can watch it if they want to spend the time. How many hours total did you did you take? We probably have uh, we probably have hundreds to even thousands of hours total of videotape over the past two and a half years um, of the really really shocking compelling stuff. We've probably got dozens upon dozens of hours, and that'll be continued to, to continue to be released in the in the days and months to come. Now, so we're going to see tape after tape after tape as as bad as the two that we've already seen, or worse. Exactly, even worse. All right, so let's talk about the funding. You know, half a billion dollars a year, taxpayer dollars. Um, it's now we've got what three separate investigations, seven separate states looking into Planned Parenthood. Um, ultimately, what would you like to have happen? You know, ultimately, I think that the public is seeing this information, and and the public is pretty outraged. There's there's already over two and a half million YouTube views on the the first video that we posted last week, and the second one is starting to climb up there. People are are responding with a lot of shock and a lot of disgust at the fact that Planned Parenthood is harvesting and selling the body parts from aborted babies, and doing so all the way with half a billion taxpayer dollars every single year. So there needs to be an immediate moratorium on all of Planned Parenthood's public funding, uh, and then there needs and that needs to be pending the the results of the of the three congressional investigations and the multiple. I think there might be eight now state investigations that are going on. It's against the law to harvest organs this way. It's against the law to perform abortions specifically designed to protect the lungs, the heart, or the liver. Um, do you expect by the time all is said and done that there's going to be some indictments of some of these people? I, I certainly hope that Planned Parenthood is held accountable to every single law that they're breaking in the course of, of this kind of this kind of activity, these real atrocities against humanity of selling the body parts and using partial birth abortions to do so. And I think that their top level people, their medical directors, their executives, both at the national level and all across the country are gonna have a lot of explaining to do once everything is said and done. Well, explain your motivation. Why did you decide to undertake this investigative report on Planned Parenthood? You know, we did this because Planned Parenthood has been harvesting and selling the body parts from the from the abortions that they commit for, for decades now. And no one has held, held, held them accountable. They've held themselves above the law. And this is something that is that is offensive to, to the American public. It's offensive to us as human beings. It violates human dignity, and it needs to stop. All right. It's grotesque. It's gruesome. And I'm glad that you were able to expose this. We'll be uh, waiting for the next tapes to be uh, revealed. Thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you, Sean. Well, I think that uh, Center for Medical Progress really deserves a lot of kudos for the things that they're doing to expose these, frank, frankly, atrocities that are taking place uh, daily around uh, in clinics around the United States. This is just uh, atrocious, and it really needs to be stopped. <clears throat> well, let's look now. A little bit more, we talked about the Iran nuke deal last week, and there were a lot of developments with regard to it this week. It is a very significant thing, I believe, from a prophetic standpoint. Uh, Tehran uh, now wants to uh, you know, continue to do uh, nuclear power. Uh, we showed you a copy of the report last week and the Ayatollah's response. Now, one of the things that we reported on last week, which was, was sort of breaking news at the time, was the fact that um, the Obama administration had devised a plan to do an in run around Congress. Now, when they sold this to Congress and said, we're doing these negotiations, Congress wanted to have approval of this, and the Obama administration agreed to that. But then the Obama administration did something very clever, devious, I guess is another way of saying it, in that they took it directly to the UN Security Council and to the UN for a vote in an effort to just essentially make Congress's vote on this irrelevant. So this week there were hearings uh, on Capitol Hill. First thing that happened was the UN Security Council voted on Monday morning in session 15 to zero. Uh, everybody on the Security Council, Jordan, uh, France, United Kingdom, United States, all the other countries that are uh, permanent members of the Security Council or on the Security Council on a rotating basis voted for this resolution that would approve the Iranian nuclear deal. It passed without any objection. Um, the Hezbollah leader said that 
This proves that Iran is not going to abandon support for Hezbollah, a known terrorist organization. Iran's relationship with its allies is based on ideological grounds and come before the political interest. This led to a uh, statement by Israeli UN Ambassador uh, Prosser, and here's a little bit of a clip of what he had to say about what this deal really means. Ladies and gentlemen, today you have awarded a great prize to the most dangerous country in the world. I hate to be the one who spoils the party, but someone has to say that the emperor has no clothes. Today is a very sad day, not only for the state of Israel, but for the entire world. Even at this moment, the international community refuses to see the tragedy. It is a sad day because the international community is taking steps to lift the sanctions on Iran without first waiting to see if Iran complies with even a single obligation in the agreement. For the first time, Anyone can remember, Israel and the Arab world see eye to eye. This deal is dangerous for the region, for the people of the region, Jews, Muslims, and Christians alike, and for the entire world. You and the international community have a bad track record when it comes to seeing impending disasters, even when it is right in front of your eyes, which is Iran's empire of terror. Now take a cl close look at this map. This is what the world looked like this morning before you voted on the process of removing sanctions from Iran. You can see the impact of Iran's terror apparatus with your own eyes here. Iran will now have 150 billion dollars to fund terrorist groups. So the 150 billion question is, what will this map here look like tomorrow? How? But if it is aware of the tragedy and still chooses to pursue this dangerous path, this is a catastrophe. And he's right. Uh, there were also, um, Kerry issued some statements about an attack on Israel would be, a, an attack by Israel and Iran would be a huge mistake. Uh, he was very critical of people who are concerned about this deal, saying that they're spinning fantasy. This has been in the uh, American and Jewish press and other, uh, other places all week. By the way, uh, you also see there's a note there that Jonathan Pollard uh, may be released soon by the Obama administration. I think that this is just a little act of appeasement by the Obama administration to keep their uh, keep in the good graces of as many uh, Israeli and Jewish people that they can. Uh, I think it's just I think it's a very cynical act that they would do this at this time. It, it's clear that they don't do this because they care about anything. They're doing it because they're just trying to preserve their political capital for the next election. Well, one of the things that happened was that. Uh, Secretary Jack Lew, who you see here in the center of this uh, picture, and others took uh, the Iran nuclear deal to a private uh, classified session, a briefing session for members of Congress, uh, specifically the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It's reported that, that few House members stayed for the whole uh, briefing. I find this stunning that this is happening, that People don't care enough about uh, a deal with probably the most dangerous uh, nation on the planet. Uh, there are, I'm going to now play some clips from the hearing that took place uh, the next day with uh, Senator uh, Secretary Jack Lew, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of State John Kerry. First, I'm going to play you a clip from the Today Show, which... Uh, in which John Kerry is interviewed about the deal. This happened before he testified in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Try to bring it down into some way that we can understand it. If the police in this city suspected some guys down the block were running a meth lab, yeah, but this wouldn't, is not drugs. Know, but this wouldn't is it be amazing material. if they called those people, say, we think you're doing that, and then wait 24 days to go in and look at it? It's so different from that, Matt, and that is what people need to focus on. This is nuclear material. 
it is it, it radiates it's 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 you you have the ability for literally a thousand years to be able i mean this is not something that you can flush down the toilet it's not possible israel hates this deal they've made no bones some people about do that. no the former head of shin bet believes it's a good deal the former head of the mossad believes it's a good the deal prime minister the former does head not of the, like this well, deal. The prime minister doesn't i understand that but there are lots of people in israel who understand this is the best way to proceed in order to roll back iran's program and make israel safe do you think because many in israel including the prime minister are very uncomfortable with this <clears> deal that it's now making it more likely than two years ago, for example, that Israel might attempt some unilateral action, military or cyber attack, against Iran? Well, I think that'd be an enormous mistake, a huge mistake with grave consequences for Israel and for the region, and I don't think it's necessary. The fact is that we will have, uh, for 15 years, a restraint on Iran that absolutely prevents it from developing a weapon. They can't enrich beyond 3.67%. You can't make a bomb at 3.67%. They will only have 300 kilograms of a stockpile of enriched uranium. You can't make a bomb with that. They will have inspections on a daily basis in their enrichment facilities. If the Israelis so we are not are, convinced we're confident and they this. take that action, where would it leave us? Would we support Israel? Would this treaty go up in smoke? Well. Uh, if they bombed them, sure, I, I presume uh, Iran would then have a reason to say, well, this is why we need a bomb. And what Iran will decide to do is dig deeper because Israel does not have the ability, nor do we, to stop unless we went to all-out war and, and, and literally annihilated Iran, which I don't hear people talking about. So if you proceed along a normal, uh, reasonable military operation, you're talking about rolling their program back for two to three years. Then what do you do? And if you did that, what will Iran's response be? Most likely to decide, now you've proven why we need a bomb, and they will dig deeper and go out and, and get it. What people forget is, this is not something that may happen in the future, Matt. Iran already has enough fissile material for 10 to 12 bombs. They haven't decided to make it. They haven't done it yet. We're rolling that back. Then the, uh, there was a hearing at uh, Congress or in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And, uh, of course, you can see that uh, Code Pink, the uh, peace, crazy peace activist, actually gave Kerry a standing ovation when he came into the hearing room. Uh, they actually had to remove some of the people because of their uh, sheer joy and disruptive behavior about this uh, particular deal. So here's some clips from the hearing. I have to say we had a briefing last night, and I left there. I talked to members on both sides of the aisle. Um, I was fairly depressed uh, after last night's presentation. With every detail of the deal that was laid out, um, our witnesses success successfully batted them away with the hyperbole that it's either this deal or war. And therefore, we were never, never able to appropriately question or get into any of the details because every time we did it was either this deal or war that's senator uh the chairman of the senate foreign relations committee bob corker a senator republican senator from uh, tennessee here's uh, some additional comments made at the hearing from my perspective mr secretary um i'm sorry not unlike a hotel guest that leaves only with a hotel bathrobe on his back, I believe you've been fleeced. Uh, to say this is, uh, to, to be able to walk away from this and say that this is a good deal is ludicrous. With all due respect, you guys have been bamboozled and the American people are going to pay for that. Uh, the comment was made that, uh, what is it, naive if you think this is a good deal. This is an article from the Washington Post. I urge you all to read it. How the Iran deal is good for Israel, according to Israelis who know what they're talking about. <laughs> I urge you to read it. Uh, it says here, a host of prominent members of the country's security establishment have come out at various stages of negotiations in support of the Obama administration's efforts. In an interview this week with the Daily Beast, Ami Ayalan, former head of Shin Bet, or Israel's top domestic security agency suggested Israel's politicians were playing with fears in a fearful society. 
He praised the Vienna Agreement as a useful measure to curb the Iranian threat. I don't think he's naive. He praised uh, he, uh, Ephraim Halevi, former chief of the Mossad, Israel's spice agency, hailed Obama's victory. I support the right of my colleagues to say anything they want. But you've sat there and you've heard two of my colleagues go after you uh, with words that I'm going to repeat. You were fleeced, one said. The other said you've been bamboozled. So putting aside the fact I think that's disrespectful and insulting, it, there's, that's their right to do. There are other ways to express your disagreement. But that goes to the, your core as a human being and your intelligence. And I think you're highly intelligent. So let me ask you, and if you could just answer yes or no, I know it's hard for you, Secretary Kerry, to do so. <laughs> because we're senators and it's not our way. But I, then I can get through the rest of my list. So my colleagues think that you were fleeced that you were bamboozled, that means everybody was fleeced and bamboozled, everybody, almost everybody in the world. So I want to ask you, does the United Kingdom, our strong ally, support this accord? Yes. Uh, does Australia, one of our strongest allies, support this accord? Yes. Does Germany support this accord? Yes. Does France support this accord? Yes. Uh, did, did Jordan voice its support yes. in their vote? Yes. You get the drift. If you were bamboozled, the world has been bamboozled. That's ridiculous. And it's unfair. And it's wrong. You can disagree, for sure, with aspects of this agreement. But I think we need to stay away from that kind of rhetoric. Well... That's where we get the title for this presentation, thanks to Bill Salas, for Bomboozled. Uh, that was a stunning display by the uh, senator from California. The next person to comment, I believe, is Senator uh, Bob Menendez from New Jersey. Um, he's a Democrat, and he's been a very, very strong critic of the Obama administration's activities, so much so that, uh, if I recall correctly, he's actually been put under indictment by the Department of Justice, which is more a political arm uh, than in any other administration in the history of our country. Um, we saw that earlier with that they would investigate the people who expose Planned Parenthood, but not Planned Parenthood. It's a, it's a stunning thing that's happening. It is uh, indicative of a society that is descending into lawlessness. Here's Senator Menendez. However, I am concerned that the deal enshrines for Iran and in fact commits the international community. I am concerned. However, I am concerned that the deal however, I am concerned that the deal enshrines for Iran and in fact commits the international community over time to assisting Iran in developing an industrial scale nuclear power program complete with industrial scale enrichment. And while I understand the program's going to be subject to Iran's NPT obligations, I think it fails to appreciate Iran's history of deception in its nuclear program and its violations of the NPT. I, I don't understand and how we ultimately have a credible belief that snapback means something if, in fact, you're not going to have the ability to have those sanctions in place. Well, it seems, it so we seems just, to, I'm, exactly. I'm reading to you. I'm reading to you from the Security Council resolution that was adopted, codifying yes, the, the Security agreement. Council and, resolution. And that Security Council resolution says, says well, Iran, Mr. Secretary, I'm reading yeah. you explicitly. This up. Iran is called upon. Correct. Not to undertake that. That's activity. the article. That's far, that's far different. Exactly. Than shall not. Senator, that's exactly what it is today. That's right. the same language as is in the embargo now. And we transferred it to this, and that's what it is. Not but the same language as, as Security Council Resolution 1929. I mean, I, I don't know why you wouldn't just keep the same language, which made it clear that you shall not, and because there shall not exist, there are consequences if you do. Mr. And what Senator Menendez was trying to 
uh, convey there is the fact that there are now uh, there's a statute in place that allows for sanctions to be enforced against Iran for violation uh, and going by going forward with its nuclear program. That law expires next year. There has been requests, uh, the negotiations between Congress and the Obama administration about uh, extending that authorization for sanctions. The Obama administration has threatened to veto it, is my understanding. So Menendez's point was, if you don't have the sanctions statute in place, what are you going to snap back to? How are you going to snap back to sanctions if they don't exist? You're then going to have to go into Congress and get them approved and get the administration, either Obama or the next person, to sign off on the legislation that allows the sanctions to be enacted. It's a great point by Mr. Menendez and Investors Business Daily followed all of this nonsense up with, yes, the world is wrong about Iran. It is a bad deal. The administration, Obama administration says that it can't have been bamboozled by Iran because that would mean our negotiating partners were tricked too, which is impossible. But they've been fooled before and there's plenty of evidence to show that uh, when back during uh, between 2000 and 2005, the European Union was pursuing a sanctions and negotiations with Iran. That was actually administered by the new president of Iran, Rouhani. And it resulted in essentially uh, Iranian oil being sold on the open market. The oil price in the world went up about fivefold. During that period of time, Iran made billions of dollars off the sale of its oil. And remember from some of the maps we showed recently, uh, last week's update, that Iran essentially controls 56% uh, of the world's oil supply right now, at least uh, in directly, at least indirectly, if not directly, because it's all located in Shiite, uh, predominant, predominantly Shiite uh, Muslim areas. So this is a, a stunning thing that's uh, happening. Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, the Supreme Leader of Iran, uh, did a couple tweets this week. One is, we welcome no war, nor do we initiate any war. But if any war happens, the one who will emerge loser will be the aggressive and criminal U.S. This is a great uh, negotiating partner that we have there, it sounds like. He also tweeted this just yesterday. The U.S. president has said that we could knock out Iran's military. We welcome no war, nor do we initiate any war. And then it's this phrase, if war happens, and you have a picture of President Obama, silhouette of President Obama holding a gun to his head. That's the people that we're negotiating with. Those are the uh, the rogue regime that we're doing this with. There's a reports that Iran is upping its uh, internal executions, that they've executed about 700 people so far this year, certainly on uh, track to exceed by probably double what they executed last year. And it's uh, it's done all done in secret, and there's these executions taking place. So this is a, this is a rogue terrorist regime, and there should be no question about that at this point. Um, on another threat, the ISIS threat, the Islamic State threat, seems to be growing. There's also reports that Jihadi John, the guy who did the beheadings, is on the run because he fears that he may uh, outlive his usefulness to the Islamic State. So he's fled to Syria, joined some. A jihadi group there uh, because he's afraid for his life that if he becomes expendable he will also be beheaded and this is the way that these regimes go they they operate in this manner um, Dennis Prager and Investors Business Daily had a column this week 1938 versus 2015 only the names change to protect the naive the Iranian regime is composed of religious fanatics who are morally indistinguishable from the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and all other mass murdering Islamist movements. He makes a number of points. He says this, the Nazi regime's great hatred was Jews, Iran's great hatred is the Jewish state. The Nazis' greatest aim was to exterminate the Jews of Europe, Iran's greatest aim is to exterminate the Jewish state. Nazi Germany hated the West and its freedoms. The Islamic State, Islamic Republic of Iran, hates the West and its freedoms. <coughs> Germany sought to dominate Europe. Iran seeks to dominate the Middle East and the Muslim world. And exactly as Britain and France appeased Nazi Germany, the same two countries along with the United States have chosen to appease Iran. 
He says this, Today people mock Chamberlain, but just change the names and you realize that we are living through a repetition of Munich. Substitute the Islamic Republic of Iran for Nazi Germany, the Ayatollah Khomeini, Ali Khomeini for Hitler, Barack Obama and John Kerry for Chamberlain, Israel for Czechoslovakia, and for Europe's Jews, and the increasingly unsafe world of 2015 for the increasingly unsafe world of 1938. In fact, there is considerably less defense for the Iran Agreement than there was for the Munich Agreement. Prior to 1938, Hitler had not publicly proclaimed his aim to annihilate Europe's Jews. Yet Iran has proclaimed its intention to annihilate the Jewish state for decades. There were no massive death to America demonstrations in Germany, as there regularly are in Iran. And here's the editorial cartoon from Ramirez, The Compromise, Death to America, and afterwards, Death to America. Nothing has changed with regard to Iran. It's not a regime that can be trusted. The New York Post had a good, uh, the New York Post had a good editorial the other day about the fact that what this appears to be designed to do is to break up the alliance between the United States and Israel. And that certainly seems to be where this is heading. And I think it's something that we need to be, look, we know that this is going to happen to the Jewish state of Israel in the end times, that they're going to be isolated. The world is going to um, gather together against them. And we see it happening right in front of our eyes. Another thing that's happening in the Middle East, the Middle East nuclear power play no one is talking about, I'll try to talk about this in a couple weeks, is it's not just Iran. It's Turkey, it's Egypt, it's other Islamic states in the Middle East that are being pursued now with nuclear capabilities by Russia. Now that has significant prophetic implications itself and I don't really have time to go into it this week. What's interesting in all of this is that even though Great Britain did sign on to the uh, new uh, the UN Security Council resolution of uh, the United Kingdom that uh, David Cameron appears to be um, getting it in some respects. He's looking at, he's uh, come out speaking against uh, people who make conspiracies that the Jews want to take over the world. Uh, I think this is something that even people on the Christian side of things or claim to be Christian side of things need to take note of. There's, I see a lot of conspiracy theories out there these days and we've said that we don't adopt those here at Fellowship Bible Chapel. Uh, we're not saying that Israel's perfect, or that Zionism is perfect, but we know that this is the plan that will unfold in the end times according to the scripture. Cameron said this, simply denying any connection between the religion of Islam and the extremists doesn't work because the extremists are self-identifying as Muslims. This is a big change from what he said just even a couple of weeks ago. Melanie Phillips in Friday's Jerusalem Post, Arming All Sides for Nuclear War, has a great article about this development with David Cameron. And this is what she says. If the P5 plus one negotiators had deliberately set out to produce an Orwellian neg negation of every single thing they purported to be doing, making themselves appear guilty of criminal cynicism, treachery, or utter imbecility, they could not have exceeded the terms of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action finalized in Vienna. This plan has endorsed Iran, the West's sworn enemy and the world's principal sponsor of terrorism, as a nuclear threshold state. The plan allows Iran to keep its nuclear program intact. As At best, it will delay its nuclear weapons breakout capacity by 10 years. The U.S. revealed its true intentions when it declared that it would now supply both Israel and Saudi Arabia with extra weapons to protect themselves against the Iranian threat. But since the Obama administration never stops claiming that its plan will neutralize the Iranian threat, why give Saudi and Israel this extra protection? Why do they need to be protected with more weapons if the deal is such a good deal and it's going to work? I don't even think the Obama administration believes its own rhetoric. The brutal and terrible answer is that what America, Britain, and the rest are in reality now doing is helping arm all sides in the region for nuclear war. We know why President Obama has done this. As a left-wing ideologue with a pathologically racist chip on his shoulder against white society, he believes that peace and justice will be advanced by empowering 
the presumed historic victims of America. He still doesn't see the bigger geopolitical picture. He doesn't see that far from helping the West against ISIS. Iran is merely another front in exactly the same war against civilization. He doesn't see that the need to destroy the Iranian regime is part of the same struggle of our generation. Someone should help David Cameron join up the dots and fast. Great article by Melanie Phillips, as usual. Really one of the two or three writers that I would recommend you read all of her columns. Uh, she's a great writer. Now look, we know that this, is, this rise of Persia is something, Iran or Persia, biblical Persia, is something that we're going to see in the end times. Look at what it says in Daniel 10. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, I then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Hupaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his feet as the lamps of his feet of, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass, and the multi, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned to me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, I was in deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set upon me my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand that the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright, for unto thee now am I sent. Or, excuse me, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So Daniel's been praying and fasting for three weeks, and this man tells him, I was sent to you the day you started praying. But it's been three weeks. What happened? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, remember we see in scripture that we fight not against earthly things, but against principalities and powers. And so behind these regimes, these rogue regimes in the world, there are demonic dark forces. And what happened back at the time of Daniel is happening again now. This dark force, I think, is being demonstrated by the kingdom of Persia, the nation of Iran. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for one for one and 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. Forget the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became numb. And behold, one of the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake, and said unto him that stood before me, O oh, my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there is there remain no strength in me, neither is there left breath in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me, and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then he said to me, Knowest thou not where I, wherefore I come unto thee? And now I will, will return to fight with the prince of Persia. This is something that is ongoing in the heavenlies. And when I come, when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So we see that uh, there's this uh, prophecy here about Persia and also about the coming prince of Greece. And uh, we've talked about that in some of our look at some of the beast empires that have existed throughout history and prophecy. And that we'll have 
I think, some significance in the uh, end times. Also on Friday's Jerusalem Post was an article by Caroline Glick, or a column by Caroline Glick, talking about the withdrawal from Gaza that happened 10 years ago. Israel's withdrawal from Gaza 10 years ago was a tr strategic disaster, but it could have been much more devastating if the ideologues behind it had had their way. Formally, the withdrawal was supposed to do two things. It was supposed to strengthen Israel's diplomatic position vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and Europe by demonstrating Israel's commitment to a Palestinian state, and it was supposed to enhance Israel's security by redeploying the IDF along more defensible lines. The truth is, these justifications were never anything more than a smokescreen to hide the true purpose of the withdrawal from the public. The real purpose of the withdrawal from Gaza was to deal a strategic blow to Zionism and the Jewish character of the state of Israel. She's exactly right about this. And this is something that's been ongoing. It's fought internally in Israel every day by people who don't really appreciate the Jewish character of the nation of Israel. And this happened when we forced the withdrawal in Gaza. And this is what we see uh, happening day by day. Now, Hillary like Clinton was asked recently about what she thinks about a two-state solution, I think at the same campaign stop in Greenville, South Carolina, and she had this comment. Do you believe that a two-state solution is still possible in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And as president, what would you do to encourage Israel to pursue that path? Thank you. Yes, I do believe it's possible, and I believe it's the only resolution that will work. I think there has to be a negotiated settlement. We have to look for a way to uh, persuade both sides to do more to um, demonstrate unequivocally their commitment to a two-state solution. Uh, and there are steps that both sides can and should make that I would be promoting. So your question is, a, is a, a very important one, and there is no alternative, and I will continue to work for that because I believe it is the best outcome for both Israelis and Palestinians in the region. A lot, there's some controversy these days about, well, we don't really need a Jewish state of Israel for the end times, but I want to refer you to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, which says this, And at that time, Michael, shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. There will be a nation of Israel in the end times. We see a nation of Israel, which is indicative of the time that we live. And Daniel 12.1 clearly refers to the fact that there will be and there is a nation of Israel when these things start to unfold. We live what it, very close to the beginning of the 70th week, which will start with a covenant. This is a prophecy in Daniel's uh, prophecy of the 70 weeks. I don't have time to go into it a lot today, but I'll just remind you about this. This is what it says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. That there's 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years. Remember, Daniel was praying, uh, or was reading uh, the scroll of Jeremiah, and he he noticed that this, there was a, a period prophesied for the captivity of 70 years. And he realized that that 70-year period was coming to an end. And so what did he do? Well, he went and he prayed that God would fulfill his prophecy. Like, we should go and pray that God will fulfill his prophecies. But then it's interesting in Daniel chapter 9, he's visited and he gets this message like, you're worried about 70 years? I'm going to show you 70 sevens, 70 times or seven times that number that is determined for your people. So here's what it says about the 70 weeks, the purpose of the 70th week, the 70 weeks. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And there's given the reasons to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's the purpose of the 70th week. So we know that 
or 70 weeks. So we know that there will be this period of 70 weeks of seven years, 2,520 days, plus this period on the end of 30 days and 45 days. You can read about that near the end of Daniel chapter 12. I don't really have time to go into it today. We know in the midpoint of that, that one of the things it says in 2 Thessalonians is that someone who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We know that that's a prophecy. And we know that there will be, because of that, that during this 70th week, there will be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem that the people of Israel will use to worship God. Now, we know that it's not done in the proper fashion. We know that it will be used by the Antichrist, but it is a component of end times Bible prophecy. And I'm going to close with this today because there was a rather significant announcement made in Jerusalem this morning by the Temple Institute. Now, we know that just last week they had made an announcement about the red heifer and uh, that they were going to raise red heifers. They need the ashes of the red heifer to purify the temple vessels <clears throat> and the priests that will be doing service in the temple that's going to be rebuilt. But today, on the... 9th of Av, this morning in Jerusalem, the Temple Institute released a video about plans to build what they call the Third Holy Temple. It says this, this is not a re virtual representation, but a portion of a complete and highly detailed architectural plan which has been prepared for the immediate construction of the Holy Temple. This plan includes all of the, all of the components that will be used in building marble, stone, concrete, wood, floorings, materials, overlay of gold, etc. So here we are, Tishbayav, the third Holy Temple plans have begun. Here is the video released this morning by the Temple Institute. <music>
Well, it certainly is interesting timing the building of this temple. In the Wall Street Journal yesterday, uh, there was a very interesting article in their review section. And I just find it interesting that I found this in a secular newspaper. It's titled, the article is titled, The Poet's Apocalyptic Vision. The Second Coming outlines William Butler Yeats' fearful vision of the future based on the moral anarchy of the present. Listen to just a little bit of this article. This is in a secular newspaper yesterday. And understand the timing of everything that went on this week in Washington and the announcements coming out of Jerusalem this morning. If our age is apocalyptic in mood and rife with doomsday scenarios, nuclear nightmares, religious fanatics, and suicidal terrorists, there may be no more chilling statement of our condition than William Butler Yeats' poem, The Second Coming. Written in 1919 in the immediate aftermath of the epic ending disaster that was World War I, the second coming extrapolates a fearful vision from the moral anarchy of the present. The poem also almost incidentally serves as an introduction to the great Irish poet's complex conception of the history, which is cyclical, not linear. Things happen twice. The first time is sublime, the second time is horrifying, so that instead of the second coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeats envisions a monstrosity, a rough beast threatening violence commensurate with the human capacity for bloodletting. And it goes on to quote from, uh, set out his poem, the short poem that he wrote. And says this, as a summary of the present age, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Stanza 1 lays the groundwork for the vision spelled out in stanza 2, which is as terrifying in its imagery as it is in its open-ended conclusion. The rhetorical question that makes it a plain that a rough beast is approaching, but leaves the monstrous details for us to fill. It's an interesting thing that this would be, at this time, would be in the review section of one of the leading newspapers of the world. Um, it's interesting. I do think that people, secular people, and other people understand that something is going on. This convergence of events indicates that something is going on, and we need to be prepared. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for your word. Thanks for letting us know what we could expect in the future. Lord, I pray that you would raise up more people, and more pastors, to warn people of those things that are coming upon the world. And that we would take that information, use it as a motivation to clean up our lives and to share the gospel as we've never shared the gospel before with other people. Bless us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.